that are struggling to make ends meet, to uh, hold things together. Uh, Display California and its annex, they will pop up uh, behind me, uh, all told has nine employees. Uh, none have been fired, uh, some unfortunately furloughed because of the shutdown, because of the stay at home order. As we move, as we announced this week, to modify in a meaningful way into what we call phase two, our stay at home order, it's businesses like this that can reopen for curbside pickup. Uh, Rashawn and his wife have been uh, doing their best under the circumstances here uh, to provide online sales and to keep uh, the doors not physically open, but uh, you know, open in the sense that the business is still able to operate and generate a little bit of cash flow. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's just not going to be enough to sustain this business for much longer. And so it's incumbent upon uh, all of us to work with businesses like this to make sure when we do start to open up the economy, we do so in a safe and judicious way. Uh, with the indicator of health uh, guiding our strategies, guiding our decision making, always on the basis of public health. Uh, we're in a position here in the state uh, to begin to move into phase two uh, because millions of Californians uh, have appropriately distanced themselves from one another through the stay at home order and the physical distancing guidelines. We've been able to flatten the curve uh, in a meaningful and significant way over the course of many, many weeks. Uh, just yesterday, we put out a report card on our progress using those six indicators that guide our determination of whether or not we can move into these new phases. Uh, we talked yesterday about new tracing uh, and new technology that we want to put to bear uh, to begin to track, isolate, and quarantine individuals. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have the first cohort of tracers that will start taking our virtual online academy courses. Uh, in partnership with UCSF and UCLA. Uh, we made uh, a final uh, commitment uh, to advance that effort using a new data management platform in partnership with Accenture, uh, Amazon, and Salesforce uh, that will be providing the ability in real time to share information uh, and to collect data uh, on a cross-county uh, basis. That is a fundamental part uh, of our efforts to provide not only the workforce, uh, 10,000 in phase one, 20,000 within two months of tracers, uh, disease detectives, and lexicon perhaps uh, more easily understood, uh, that will be deployed all throughout the state of California. Bottom-up, county-based led effort, utilizing the existing workforce of roughly 2,800 or so folks, just side 3,000 individuals that are currently doing tracing in the state of California. That augmented resource will allow us to move into this phase with our capacity in real time to determine the spread and be able to isolate individuals, quarantine individuals in a way that will allow us to methodically move through uh, this phase into subsequent phases. Remember, deaths, hospitalization, and ICUs are lagging indicators. The more testing we do, our ability to track, to trace, and to isolate and quarantine, that allows us more real-time information that allows us to move into this new phase uh, and stay in that phase uh, in a very, again, judicious and thoughtful way. Uh, this whole effort's been led uh, by our health team in partnership and collaboration and council with public health officials all across the state of California. As we said yesterday, we'll be putting out the guidelines this Thursday and businesses like this can start to open as early as Friday of this week. We were talking to Rashawn just a moment ago what that would look like uh, for him. Uh, and it's a supply chain issue, not just a customer interface issue, as he reminded us. It's the things that come through the back door, meaning product that are displayed here at this business. Uh, and it's the ability to sell those products in a very thoughtful way with a deep framework of sanitization, a deep framework on protecting his employees, uh, as well as protecting his customers. So from the supply chain, which will begin to open up manufacturers, logistics to support businesses like this in this new phase, it's incumbent at all levels uh, that we have strong protocols in place, but none more important than appropriate protective gear. The PPE side of this is so foundational 
in our ability to open up to make sure people have the appropriate face coverings, that they have the support they need to keep these facilities, to keep uh, these retail establishments sanitized, and to make sure customers, again, and employees are safe. We're very pleased in the state uh, to have had substantial success in the last week in procurement of tens of millions of new masks that are now coming in um, almost on a weekly basis. Uh, let me be specific. We've been able to distribute 14.2 million procedure masks, these surgical masks, uh, since the beginning of this pandemic. We currently have an inventory of 19.3 million masks that have come in over the course of the last number of days. We'll get those masks out as soon as we possibly can. Uh, but I can assure you, in all of these months, we have never had so many uh, procedure masks, surgical masks, in our possession now, able to be distributed all across the state of California. Again, we've prioritized our healthcare uh, uh, professionals, we've prioritized our first responders, our skilled nursing facilities, assisted living, but we will, as these product lines uh, begin to open up and we have more of this product, start getting out to the front lines for our grocery workers, get it out to the front lines in terms of our transit workers and our retail workers as well. PPE, not just testing and tracing, is so foundational in terms of moving into this next phase and being able to methodically, judiciously, and thoughtfully begin to reopen up our economy with adaptation, with modifications. Uh, the spirit that brings us here today is the spirit that defined the opening of this business in 2014. That's the spirit of entrepreneurialism, a spirit of a mindset that's alive and well in the state of California. It's appropriate that we're in a business that sells California-based products, uh, California-based designers and makers, uh, and brings that ingenuity and that talent to bear uh, in a curated way at this space, and making it available uh, to support our economy, but also to support other entrepreneurs in our economy. It's a, perhaps a long way of saying this. We're not just talking about one small business. It's the business's impact on that entire supply chain and on the creativity and the ingenuity and the innovative spirit that defines the best of California. Businesses are not just about dollars and cents. They're about community and they're about a sense of spirit and pride uh, where people can put their wares, uh, put their ideas uh, and make them real, make them visible uh, and create opportunities and, and create, uh, uh, you know, manifest dreams at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, I can say this as a small business person myself, this all starts as a dream. Uh, it starts as an idea, uh, pen then to paper, and to see your dream come to fruition and potentially be at risk because of this pandemic is devastating. And so I, it's a way of expressing not just empathy, but a deep admiration and appreciation uh, for these entrepreneurs that put everything on the line. And truly, everything is on the line uh, as we move into this next phase to make sure we do it right and to make sure we don't jump ahead of ourselves and have a second wave that then forces us to toggle back and now put back into place the restrictions that we're now in a position to finally loosen up. And so it's a long way of just repeating a mantra. We have to maintain uh, the core construct of our stay at home orders and make sure that we are appropriately doing the social distancing and the physical distancing uh, that is necessary at this moment, particularly as we move into this new phase uh, where that behavior becomes even more essential because we put more and more people at risk as we begin to open things back up. And that's why I cannot impress upon people more uh, that we're not going back to normal. It's back to a new normal with adaptations and modifications until we get to immunity, until we get to a vaccine. We'll get there. That's coming, that will happen. The question is, what happens in between. And in this state, you've just done such a remarkable job uh, keeping that line, keeping uh, our total number of positives, hospitalization, people vulnerable in our ICUs uh, in a stable place uh, compared to many other parts of this country. And I just want folks to know we're grateful to you. You're the reason we're in this position, why I'm here today, uh, and why I'm looking forward uh, to moving through this weekend and begin to see some new retail open up uh, with these modifications and to start seeing 
uh, these manufacturers and logistical support uh, begin to take shape as well and help again uh, start to rebuild uh, this economy and get us back on our feet. Uh, with that in mind, before I get to all of the daily updates, uh, I wanted to acknowledge uh, a local elected official, someone uh, known very well here in Northern California, uh, the former pro tem, the uh, state senate, now mayor uh, of the city of Sacramento. Uh, mayor Steinberg has been essential and critical in terms of helping guide us to this point. Uh, and one thing is clear to me, at the end of the day, we put out these guidelines at the state level, but its application, its implementation is manifested at the local level. And that's why local electeds are so important. Mayors at this moment are so important. That collaborative spirit between the city uh, of Sacramento uh, and the state of California has been demonstrable for many, many years, but notably many months through this pandemic, including the announcements a few weeks back of Project Room Key to help uh, Californians uh, that are out on the streets and sidewalks and in shelters are homeless and get their support. Daryl was critical in helping advance that effort. He's critical in terms of advancing this effort as well. Wouldn't be appropriate to be at a retailer in the city of Sacramento just days away uh, from beginning to reopen parts of this economy with conditions uh, if we did invite uh, the mayor uh, to say a few words with that uh, Sacramento mayor, Daryl Steinberg. Thank you very much, Governor Newsom. Um, I want to thank you for your steadfast leadership, for your wise judgment, and for leading California back, but in the right and safe way. This cannot be a choice between public health and reopening the economy. We know that we must do both. And so you have now said to us, and we are now on the ground beginning to think about the implementation. It is not a question of if, it is not a question of when, it is a question of how. How we go about reopening will define, as you said a moment ago, whether or not we can move with effectiveness to the next stages and open up more, or whether or not we are going to have to take a small step, a medium step, or in the worst case, a large step backward and keep the economy closed for longer. We know there is only one way to go, and that is forward. And so how we reopen at the local level and throughout the state is absolutely crucial. Whatever may seem like a small inconvenience is not an inconvenience when you consider the alternative. To be able to shop at Rashawn and Maritza Davis's Display California store, but to have to pick up at curbside is no big deal. To make sure that you don't come if you're not feeling well, to make sure that with the work you have done, Governor, to assure that we have more masks, to wear masks when you're out in public, to provide that extra layer of protection, to make sure that you are always washing your hands and that we are always uh, using the right sanitation supplies in our retail spaces. We do all of that, and the governor will then be in the position, we will all be in the position where we can confidently take the next steps and open more and return, yes, not to normal, but to the new normal, which will reconnect us as members of our community, which will allow more of our small businesses to recover and ultimately to grow and will allow us to see that new day in California again where we are open for business. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you, 
Mr. Mayor, and again, thank you for all your leadership. And again, uh, that central nature of partnership at the local level as we begin the application and implementation with these new guidelines will be coming up on Thursday and the application and the conditions uh, that we are setting forth uh, through the weekend over the course of the next few weeks. Uh, it is just essential uh, that we get feedback in real time from city leaders, from county leaders, and more important than all, our health directors, uh, so that we are maintaining uh, a public health mindset uh, as our top priority. Uh, I also want to just extend uh, a prioritization uh, beyond just our capacity to begin uh, these meaningful modifications, but also to know what do what we can to help support these small businesses with loan assistance. Uh, as you know, the Small Business Association uh, administration rather has a number of small business loans, and of course, uh, federally, the CARES Act, uh, this PPP uh, program, distinguished from PPE, that's Personal Protective Equipment, the PPP program uh, is that support program uh, that has gotten a lot of attention and drawn a lot of anxiety for businesses all across the United States to draw down loans or potentially uh, forgivable loans in the future. The first round uh, of dollars, Californians did not fare as well as we should have in terms of the percentage of the loans we were able to draw down uh, and the number of dollars that we were able to draw down. Uh, I want to just update you on the good news. Uh, the first uh, round of PPP, $33.4 billion uh, was distributed in the state of California uh, in terms of those uh, business supports. With just 60% of the second uh, PPP program, just 60% of the second PPP program, we have already drawn down $33.2 billion. So roughly the equivalent amount of the entire FIRST program, even though just 60% of the funds have been distributed uh, nationwide. It's a way of saying this, we are doing much better in this second round. Uh, more loans, almost three times as many loans have been drawn down in the state of California, uh, and more money. So we're very encouraged by that. Uh, when you add up both loan programs, average them out, uh, we're currently uh, doing about 11.2% of all of uh, the loans in America and 12.9%, roughly 13% of all of the money coming into the state. It's getting closer to where it should be. Uh, again, the good news is 60% uh, in the second round, and that's where we're punching above our weight. Critical for small businesses to be able to draw those dollars down. Critical that people that don't need it don't take advantage of that program, and critical for companies uh, that are very large and have huge cash capacity uh, not to compete with businesses like this that must be uh, the top priority of a program like that. So I wanted to update you uh, on the PPP program. Uh, some good news there as it relates to California punching above its weight uh, on this second iteration of that uh, plan. I also want to give you an update briefly on uh, some very positive developments in Orange County. Uh, I announced yesterday Laguna Beach uh, we announced yesterday uh, the work uh, that we had done with their mayor uh, and the work we're doing in San Clemente to reopen the beaches down there. I couldn't be more complimentary of their local elected officials, the mayor of Laguna Beach, a prime example, how collaborative and cooperative his team was with our team uh, to come up uh, with appropriate restrictions in terms of beach access, but to be able to open up uh, those beaches for access. We announced those yesterday. Good news is just a few hours ago, we were able to make similar commitment uh, in terms of protocols and procedures with Huntington Beach, Dana Point, and Seal Beach. So those are opening back up as well. And again, extension of real gratitude for their local elected officials that worked so closely with our teams over the weekend and over the course of the last 24 hours. So that we're in a position to make that announcement. It's the spirit of collaboration and cooperation uh, that is necessary as we move forward. And again, I want to express gratitude to folks in Ventura, San Diego, LA, and elsewhere that also offered guidance and assistance on some of their best practices and their protocols that are all aiding and helping support uh, these broader efforts. So Huntington Beach reopening, 
uh, Dana Point reopening, Seal Beach reopening, uh, working with the county supervisors in Orange County. We hope new developments there very shortly as well as Newport, uh, but real progress in that space, again, in the spirit of collaboration, in the spirit of partnership. And again, I, more than anyone, look forward to making subsequent announcements in this space as we move forward. Just briefly, uh, we reached a milestone, an important one, over $10 billion of unemployment insurance we've now distributed uh, to people all across the state of California just since March 15th. Again, this is unprecedented in our state's history. Uh, these are numbers no one thought they'd see in our lifetime. $10.1 billion, uh, to be exact, now has been distributed. Some 4.1 million people have filed for unemployment, not since May, uh, March 15th, but since March 12th. Uh, that includes people under the PUA program, uh, a, lot of, a lot of letters, PUA, not PPP, not PPE. The PUA program is the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program, like unemployment insurance uh, for people that are self-employed, uh, people in the gig economy and the like. Roughly 450,000 of those four plus million people that have filed uh, for claims are in that category. And, as you know, we're getting a stubborn amount of money out, meaning not the full amount, but getting at least $767 out uh, as the first round of contribution as we adjudicate uh, the facts on the actual claims. Now, this goes deep into the issues uh, uh, that have been brought to the fore today uh, through a lawsuit by our Attorney General and a number of city attorneys related to uh, misclassification of employees, related to AB5 uh, vernacular uh, Assembly Bill 5 that people know well here in the state of California. Bill that is a full effect of law. It's a codification of a Supreme Court decision uh, well over a year ago. Uh, and in our January budget, we announced the enforcement uh, of that in terms of requisite uh, rec uh, recommendations uh, to get more personnel and staff. Uh, the budget that I'll be submitting uh, uh, as the May revise on May 14th uh, will further that effort. Uh, and I just say that to make this point. Uh, we have a lot of work to do in that space around misclassifications, the PUA issues related to UI issues, just under grid some of the anxiety in that space, just one of many reasons uh, why uh, we're pleased the state of California is taking leadership in this space. But in that transition, uh, always there are some challenges. Uh, final uh, point before I open up to questions. Uh, I, I want to just update you on the total number of positives in the state of California, total number of lives lost, hospitalizations, and ICUs. Um, in terms of the total number of new positives, 1,275 uh, new positives uh, that uh, we identified yesterday. What's significant about that is that number is plus or minus in a margin that we've seen over the course of the last number of days. And just over the course of the last number of days, roughly the last three days, we've tested just shy of 100,000 people just in the last three days in the state of California. We've tested now uh, just shy of 780,000 people uh, in this state, roughly 100,000 just in the last three days. The good news is total number of positives at 1,275 remain within a margin of error, error fairly steady despite the significant uh, increase in the total number of tests. We saw 63 Tragically, the number is 63 uh, people lost their lives uh, in this reporting period. 63 lives torn asunder, 63 families uh, whose lives uh, have radically changed. Our heart goes out to every single one of those families. And by extension, uh, always our concern, uh, number of people in ICUs and hospitalized. Uh, we saw the hospitalization numbers drop yesterday. They went up uh, modestly uh, to the last 24 hours by 2.5. 6%, uh, but the ICU numbers went down 1.9%. Uh, so ICU's down today, hospitalizations up. Yesterday it was the opposite. The good news, again, uh, in an effort to try to not confuse you, but to also be accountable to being as precise as I possibly can. We have people under investigation, the PUIs, not the PUAs. Um, the PUIs, people under investigation, both for hospitalizations and ICUs, those numbers also dropped yesterday. It's another positive indication. If we were putting out a report card today, it would be even slightly stronger than the report card we put out yesterday that give us, again, more confidence in our capacity 
uh, to move forward uh, with the modifications of our stay-at-home order uh, later this week. Again, modest uh, but meaningful modifications, phased approach, frame of health first. These indicators will guide us into this new phase. Uh, and final words before I do open up for question, we continue to have very robust and a very, very positive conversations with our county and county health officials, our county elected representatives and health officials, uh, as they uh, understandably are inquiring uh, about the capacity to make variance requests uh, through self-attestment, self-certifications with containment plans uh, that will allow them to go deeper into our phase two. And so uh, we are working with them hand in glove. Uh, the information around uh, what the, that criteria looks like uh, will be forthcoming well within the timeline uh, we established uh, and communicated uh, yesterday. So that's a, that's a long-winded update on the day, uh, but a very, I think, positive day in, some, in terms of some of these indicators. Caution always that this can change radically as we enter into this second phase. Now with that, happy to answer any questions. Hi, Governor. My name is Ashley Zavala. I am the State Capitol Bureau reporter for Next Star Media Group, which has seven TV stations across the state between San Francisco and San Diego. Our first question today is coming from Elix Michelson at Fox 11 in Los Angeles, with you hosting a roundtable later this afternoon, and then I know you had one last week. He's wondering, what's the greatest area of concern you're hearing from small business owners so far? How do you address it? How do you enforce your guidelines so everyone gets a fair chance? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful question. It's, as you know, and many others, and I appreciate the frame of the question you referenced, uh, we've been having very robust outreach, or we are engaged in robust outreach, uh, sector by sector, uh, all throughout uh, the economy in the state of California. A few weeks back, we announced uh, a remarkable group of talented individuals, some of the uh, most well-known business leaders in the world, Tim Cook of Apple, and uh, Bob Iger of Disney, among them, as well as social justice warriors, uh, on our Economic Recovery Task Force. Uh, that task force has a dozen or so, a little less than a dozen uh, committees uh, that are advising us uh, not only regionally but sectorally uh, and beginning to help us break down uh, and work through some of the questions around guidance. I've been having a series of Zoom conference calls with business leaders of different stripes, large business, medium-sized businesses, and very small businesses to address their particular and unique needs. Uh, today, this afternoon, uh, we will be doing the same in our manufacturing uh, space. We'll be doing more in the entertainment space and others uh, over the course of the next few weeks. So it's a way of answering the question. Uh, sector by sector, uh, we begin to process that dialogue. Uh, then we process the lessons learned. Uh, we're, getting the imp uh, we're getting all the benefit of our recovery task force and the information they're providing us, and then the best practices we seek um, uh, all across the country and around, for that matter, around the world, and of course our partnership uh, with other states. And that partnership has turned out to be profoundly more impactful than even many of us originally believed. I made a comment yesterday that our regional variation strategy came in no small part because of the leadership of Jared Polis in Colorado and Governor Brown up in Oregon and the sharing of best practices in that space. So it's all of that together that allows me to answer that question. Uh, it's not just an intellectual exercise in the abstract. It's one of deep engagement. As it relates to the application of these rules, again, localism becomes so determinative. The leadership of mayors like Mayor Steinberg, the leadership of county supervisors, and again, no substitute for the leadership of county health officials. The guidance is real and it can be raw. I mentioned yesterday uh, that the alcohol beverage control had reached out to 81 businesses and 80 businesses complied. Those 81 businesses were open against the advice, counsel, and directive of their county uh, health uh, guidelines. Uh, today I got an update, it's now 82 businesses. It's interesting, they made phone calls and most of those phone calls went extraordinarily well. In a few cases, a few dozen, they had to make visits and those went extraordinarily well. There was just one outlier. So it gives you a sense on the enforcement of many of the tools in the toolkit. No one wants to be overbearing. People just want to be responsible. Um, and when you get a call from your county, you get a call from 
mayor's office, get a call from health director, get a call from state agency like the Alcohol Beverage Control, uh, know that they're just doing their job and trying to keep all of us healthy so we can get into these phases and out of these phases and in the new phases sooner than we otherwise would. Our next question is from Sophia Balog with the Sacramento Bee. She's wondering, you've said the shopping malls won't be reopening Friday, but can stores inside those malls be open for curbside pickup? What about big box centers and strip malls? Yeah, not, not in this first phase. We're going to be working with the counties on local variances, and that's the conversation we're having with the counties in real time. Their ability to move deeper into phase two, those are phase two activities, the larger malls. Uh, but in this first round, the guidelines we'll be putting out Thursday, you are correct, that's not part of the guidance we're putting out statewide, but it is part of the conversations we're having where people can attest with local certification, with concurrence on their local health director, as well as their county supervisors in consultation with their health system with a series of criteria uh, that we'll be putting out in the next few days. So that is a point of possibility but only on this regional variance basis. Next question is from Kathleen Ronay with the AP. Okay, next question is from Kathleen Ronay with the AP. She's wondering, Yuba and Sutter counties are allowing dine-in at restaurants, hair salons are open, and the Yuba Sutter Mall plans to open tomorrow. You've said counties can go deeper into phase two ahead of the state. But can they go into phase three, which includes things like hair salons? If not, then will these now opened businesses need to close? Yeah, they're making a big mistake. They're putting their public at risk. They're putting our progress at risk. We've been clear about that, uh, well aware of those examples. Uh, these are exceptions. These are real exceptions. The overwhelming majority of Californians are, are playing by the rules, doing the right thing. Uh, they've put us in a position where we're making uh, these announcements this week. Um, we have uh, guidelines, we have criteria. Uh, they can choose to work collaboratively with their health director, their county supervisors, and the state and allow us to publish those guidelines. But those are not phase three guidelines. These are getting deeper into phase two. Uh, that's what the state will afford in the short term. And to the extent that they go further, uh, they put those businesses at risk, uh, not only the health of their communities at risk. And I would encourage them just to do the right thing. Uh, and know that we are committed to working with them, as we have been, uh, and their county representatives through CSAC, League of Cities, uh, and their health directors uh, to accommodate their local needs and their regional variances. But we have a process and protocol to do that. Uh, and so we believe in ready, aim, fire, not ready, fire, aim. Next question is from the Wall Street Journal. What do you think of the timing of the AG's lawsuit now against Uber and Lyft in the middle of this pandemic? How do you expect it to affect those businesses while they're already reeling from the coronavirus slowdown? Uh, I think I said what I said about this a moment ago. Uh, doesn't surprise me. Uh, since the Dynamax ruling was years ago, I just remind uh, the person that asked the question, uh, this was a codification of a Supreme Court rule. Uh, the whole issue of misclassification didn't just occur out of nowhere to just jump uh, into uh, the consciousness uh, of these companies in, in the last number of months. It certainly well predates uh, the coronavirus. AB5 was adjudicated uh, and was compromised with a number of classifications being exempted over the course of a very robust uh, legislative calendar last year uh, with a lot of input. Not everybody was satisfied by it, but letter of the law uh, has to be applied. We want to be cooperative and collaborative, uh, but we as a state have a responsibility to do what we said we were going to do. So again, the lawsuit doesn't surprise me. And to the extent uh, the question could have easily been asked uh, from another perspective, uh, does it complicate matters that those same companies want to go to the ballot to undo the law? Uh, I imagine one could ask from that prism the same question. Next question is from Sanseri Tensal with Fox 40. She says, Governor, it's been one week since Californians could apply for the PUA. Thousands of Californians who lost jobs during the pandemic applied for regular unemployment and were surprised by a delay in help due to penalty weeks. They were told by PUA they would, there would be a fix for them. Uh, they were told they would get a letter by May 2nd telling them how to apply and get some financial relief in these unprecedented times despite the penalty weeks issue. Thousands had started a petition about this. Multiple agencies like the Center for Workers' Rights sent you a letter about a badly need fix, needed fix for these folks. 
Now these co workers haven't received letters and still haven't received any help. What's going on? Okay. And was the best idea the one that was You're good. I'll have, to, I'll have to find the letter. Forgive me. I haven't had a chance to look at the letter directly, but I'll, I'll have uh, Julie Sue, uh, whose responsibility is the EDD. Uh, I just want to, again, uh, thank Julie and her team uh, for their heroic efforts. I, I've been... Uh, I haven't been shy about this. I think on a daily basis, almost as a daily mantra, uh, have been not only monitoring, trying to address uh, these legitimate concerns that were just expressed about that very detailed uh, and important question. Uh, I talked today about the four plus million people that have applied for unemployment insurance and the PUA program. Uh, we talked about the fact we each reached the threshold of $10.1 billion that's been distributed. A couple days ago, I talked very specifically about how we moved 1,340 new people uh, to work the phones to improve the system, how we added an additional 600 staff uh, that are being redeployed uh, as we speak in real time. We talked about the new chatbots on the system. We talked about the new texting technology we are putting in to bear. Uh, we talked about the fact that we extended the hours of operation on our call center since 2013. We're 8 a.m. to noon, five days a week. Now we're 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., seven days a week. Uh, and how all of that is not good enough. That people are rightfully frustrated because of the deep anxiety and stress they have about their ability to pay uh, even for basic things like food uh, and transportation, let alone housing. And so we continue to do everything in our power to improve that process, including changing the criteria to which we adjudicate these claims. The PUA process uh, is novel for us uh, across this country, uh, and we are sharing best practices to the extent we can find them. We have 450,000 people in the queue of those 4.1 million people that are in the PUA category. We're able to get checks out, $767. That's the 600 uh, dollar check that comes from the CARES Act plus the $167, which is the minimum payments to get those processed as quickly as we can. And now we have to address uh, those deltas on those claims that, that go deep to that question. And we are doing our best uh, in real time uh, to make real uh, a lot of the things that uh, were promoted in that program. Uh, this is hardly um, a satisfactory answer uh, to those that want their check and want it now. Uh, but I will just say this. I'm very proud of Julie Sue and her team in this respect, uh, that before this pandemic, there was a three week period to which we would get a check distributed. They've been able to continue uh, in that spirit despite the unprecedented number uh, of calls, unprecedented number uh, of checks that have had to be distributed. And when I say checks, let me just also be candid with you. These are not always checks, these are debit cards. Uh, and we have a partner with one of the largest banks in the world. Uh, they ran out of plastic and they didn't even have the capacity because of their responsibilities to do similar work all across the country to even get the debit cards. We worked with them uh, to work some of those issues out. This was a few weeks ago. It's just one of many examples uh, where we're all just trying to do our best and best is not good enough. Uh, and to the extent uh, that the details of a, of a letter that I unfortunately uh, am not privy to at the moment, forgive me, uh, the multitudes, the stacks of letters I am receiving, uh, forgive me for not Having read that specific letter, uh, Julie Sue, I'm sure, has, and she'll get back to the questioner. Next question is from Doug Sovereign with KCBS. Uh, he's wondering, I'm sure you've seen the new IHME and CDC models that project big spikes in both cases and deaths after states reopen and people have more contact with each other, although they don't project such a spike in California. What does the latest run of California's model show? Why isn't the state's model pub more public? There are many people in the Bay Area and really across the state who fear it's too early to allow more reopening. How hard is it going to be to reinstate shelter-in-place orders if relaxing does bring a spike and the horse is already out of the barn? I could add about a dozen more questions to those questions, and they're all open-ended questions and the right questions to ask. So the questions we're asking in real time, we're trying to answer in real time the questions we pose uh, to the folks up in Yuba, uh, folks that want to open earlier. I want to go even further uh, than the modest but meaningful modifications uh, that are part of the announcement that we uh, are advancing here today. Uh, so look, we're going into this very thoughtfully, uh, very soberly. We recognize the challenges, uh, but as well, we also recognize that the indicators we put out 
consistently have updated the public uh, on. Uh, those indicators are guiding our decision making, and a lot of those indicators uh, are positive in terms of allowing us uh, the confidence to move into this next phase, into the second phase, in a very thoughtful and judicious way. Uh, Doug is absolutely right. Uh, we recognize that certain parts of the state uh, are in different conditions, different environments, where they don't even want to get into this second phase yet. And that's why we were crystal clear yesterday that we're not preempting local decision making in that respect. We're allowing stricter guidelines to remain in place in parts of the state where those concerns are more legitimate, more val valid. So we listen to people in real time. We collect the data in real time. You'll see in our guide guidance to go further uh, than what we announced yesterday on a regional basis that we have specific prescriptive uh, requests of those counties before they can certify or self-certify that they have to be able to answer the question Doug posed on the ability to toggle back to then strengthen again those restrictions that they may have loosened up based upon community spread, based upon hospitalizations, based upon uh, increase in surge, based upon conditions changing on the ground. We talked about seral surveillance, PCR surveillance, otherwise known as community uh, surveillance. Uh, we'll be doing a lot more of that all throughout the state of California. The tracing and tracking becomes foundational in that respect. All of those are answers to Doug's question, but each has to be tailored uh, with local conditions in mind, and that's how we are conducting ourselves uh, so that this is not just a broad mandate where everybody has to go at the same time. These are the opportunities for people to go at different times based on different conditions, but with a health frame as its foundational framework uh, and indicators guiding ultimately our decisions to move even further or to toggle back. This is our last question and it actually came from numerous outlets including Politico and the LA Times. The president tweeted just recently, just within the last hour, okay. well-run states should not be bailing out poorly run states using coronavirus as the excuse, exclamation point. The elimination of sanctuary cities, payroll taxes, and perhaps capital gains taxes must be put on the table. Also, lawsuit indemnification and business deductions for restaurants, etc. Uh, I many tweets today. I'll, I'll take a look at that tweet. Uh, let me just say this: uh, um, in the spirit of what the president said, let me reflect on it. Well-run states um, shouldn't have to bail out others. Um, I don't mind as an American citizen uh, doing even more. Uh, than other states. I'm proud to have grown up fifth generation in California. We're in a store, the personification of California designers and makers. California has historically been a donor state um, and very proud that it's been a well-managed state in this respect in particular. Uh, a year ago this month, one year ago this month, the state of California uh, was negotiating a budget uh, that needed to consider a $21.4 billion operating surplus. And I'll repeat that because it's, well, worthy of repetition. A year ago in the May revise, uh, this state uh, was presenting a budget to the legislature, my office, uh, that was trying to prioritize the use of $21.4 billion in an operating surplus. Just a few months ago, a few weeks ago, uh, in my January budget, we announced a projected $6 billion budget surplus. We had paid off uh, that wall of debt, previous administration, prior to Governor Brown, they had, Governor Brown had inherited. Uh, our bond rating went up not once, but twice. Uh, we were sitting uh, on close to $20 billion of reserves, or at least projected in January to be north of $20 billion of reserves. A, a well-managed state in that respect. We were beginning to pay down our long-term pension obligations. Uh, we made commitments of over $9 billion in that space. They're hardly perfect. I recognize that. Uh, we have a lot more work to do in that space. Uh, so I, I appreciate, to that extent, the spirit of what the President's tweet, I, I believe, uh, alluded to, that we should reward good behavior. If that's the case, California will be well positioned uh, in any subsequent uh, coronavirus uh, relief. In fact, I imagine we would be front and center in that consideration. Uh, considering the magnitude of those surpluses, considering the management uh, of our budget, uh, and considering the magnitude of this virus and its impact on our general fund. That will be made more real 
uh, when I submit to the legislature uh, the May 14th deadline for our revise, tens of billions of dollars in deficit now, just like that because of this virus. Uh, so I appreciate that sentiment, at least. Uh, the other points of that tweet are golden oldies of policy uh, differences, uh, particularly on issues related to keeping people safe and healthy uh, as it relates to uh, policies like sanctuary that have been in place uh, in states large and small all across the country, red states, blue states. Rudy Giuliani included in New York, who was an advocate for sanctuary policy. Um, that's that's a, a separate issue and well-defined in California. And I think it's one of the many lawsuits we're engaged in uh, with the administration. So good people can disagree on that. But on the issue of bailing out well-managed states, I think California is going to be uh, very firmly grounded as a beneficiary of that sentiment, if indeed that sentiment is advanced in meaningful federal support, which is absolutely necessary to avoid cuts that none of us want to make uh, over the course of the next few months as we try to balance, as we're statutorily required, our budget uh, by the end of June, uh, or middle end of June. With that, uh, I want to just thank everybody again for their time and attention. Um, I think we're seeing the progress of all of your hard work. Uh, let me thank 40 million Californians uh, for everything you've done to allow us to be in this position uh, where we're beginning uh, to move back very thoughtfully into a new phase of this pandemic uh, with all the conditions, uh, nonetheless, all the modifications, uh, nonetheless, uh, I think we could continue this progress as long as we continue to take seriously this virus. This virus, again, still is ubiquitous in our society and no greater mistake we can make is forgetting that. Please, please continue the physical distancing. Please, please, to the extent you can, wear face coverings so that you can not just protect yourself but protect others. And remember, you may be asymptomatic, no symptoms, and still be able to spread this virus. You may be young and healthy and you run up and give grandma a big hug and all of a sudden, five or six days later, grandma's in the ICU. It's not a gross exaggeration. And so it's incumbent upon all of us to take seriously this moment, as much as we all, all rush back and want to just imagine a world that we didn't just live through, forget all about it. Let's not develop amnesia. Let's not, as we keep saying, run that 90 yard dash. Let's continue to move into this new phase the way we move into that stay at home order. And that's the spirit of Commonwealth, the spirit of collaboration uh, that's defined the last two months. Take care, everybody. Thanks for taking the time.